you want to get where you're going fast, go find somebody who's been there, done that, and is willing to help like give you the roadmap. Like it's really as simple as that. There's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of ups and downs that happen within that. And it's not going to be as easy as I made it sound just now, but it is that simple. Our guest today has been featured in Forbes, TechCrunch, and Entrepreneur, and is living proof that your network directly impacts your net worth. He has been interviewed and has interviewed some of the biggest names in the game, including John Maxwell, Ed Milet, Dan Locke, Shaq, Elena Cardone, and many more. Welcome to the show, the founder of Guestio, the host of Build Your Network and Figuring It Out, which are two of the hottest podcasts out right now, Travis Chappell. Hey, what's up, dude? Thanks for having me, Mike. Hey, you're welcome, man. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Guys, you can check out TravisChapel.com. I'm going to have that clickable in the show notes. Don't worry about spelling it. Also, Guestio.com will be clickable so you can check out what Travis has been working on. Thank you so much, brother, for being here and helping our audience out today. Dude, happy to be here. Happy to spend some time with you guys. Let's take a little journey down uh, memory lane, if you don't mind, if we start off here, because I want people to really, people see you now in the limelight, you know, if they've been listening to your podcast and seeing you on other shows, they know that you're you're crushing it right now. But there was this guy that was kind of door knocking, door to door sales. And if you guys are listening and not watching this on YouTube, Travis got to grin ear to ear because he knows where we're going with this. You started off a hundred percent commission. You're knocking door to door, but you wore many hats within that business. And I want to touch on it. I mean, you were recruiting, training. You even did managing, right? Managing some sales reps and you were in solar, water, and alarm systems at the time. I want you to share with us when you realized that even though you were successful, because a lot of people find that they're successful, but still unfulfilled. When did you have that realization that that wasn't what you wanted to do the rest of your life? And where did you go from there? Uh, Yeah. I mean, first off, thanks for having me. And also thanks for preparing for the interview, coming with good questions. It always helps. I basically realized it at the end of the first year that I felt was like successful, which was really my first year ever doing it full time. Cause I, I did door to door in college just to kind of, you know, make some extra cash and stuff like that. Uh, but then when I, when I graduated, I was supposed to be in full-time ministry and then I graduated right. and I didn't really want to do that. And so, uh, did you get a, a lot of backlash at that? I, I saw that in your bio, but I'm like, I don't know. Cause your whole family, basically you were in this like community, this really tight knit community yeah. Um, that was yeah, very religious. Yeah, yeah. I can't, can't bring myself to call it a cult necessarily because I think right. it does a disservice to other people who I think were it's in It's not a great word cults. to use. Yeah, I get yeah, it. Yeah, it's kind of a buzzword. I don't but think did it's you get backlash like, because you were like, hey, I appreciate tons. this, but I don't... Th- yeah. Yeah, yeah, tons. Yeah, because I, I mean, I, I um, you got to understand, like, I, when I say, like, I went to church and people are like, oh, yeah, I went to church or I grew up in church too, you know? And it's like, uh, yeah, but like, this was a little bit different, you know what I mean? Like, I, I went... I graduated college on the same campus that I graduated kindergarten from. And right. it was the same campus That's I went crazy. to church on. So it was like pretty much seven days a week. Like, you know, even Saturdays it, we were there it for It feels a like week. Truman Show. I'm thinking of the movie Truman Show. Yeah, of. yeah. I mean, <laughs> in a sense, you know, like it was very much like this this bubble that I was in. Like my church world, my school, like my, you yeah. know, my teachers are my youth leaders and my youth pastors are, you know, hanging out at school things and my friends are my church friends. They're my school friends. They're my basketball friends. They're my football friends. They're my choir friends. Like they're all, everything's the same. And so like in that world, basically in high school, they have two options, ministry or not ministry. You know, like if it's not ministry, then it's like, okay, well, we don't really know how to help you from here. So there's not really any career counselor. It's basically like, are you going to go to into ministry? If the answer is yes, then we have a college on this campus. Here's an application. There wasn't even like, let us help you find a good seminary to go to. And maybe you, maybe this one would be a good fit as well. It was like, oh, you want to go to Bible college? Cool. Here's an application, you know? So um, it was very one it track that, minded, like basically yeah, every, was, everybody was being put into a Everybody was trying to, everybody and... was, yeah, they were trying to fit everybody in the same, in the yeah. same peg, you know? Right. And, uh, and I, I was, I was one of those people and I, I, you know, was fully bought in. I tend to, I tend to be all in on anything that I do. And so at the time for me, it was that until I realized that when I was about to graduate that like, man, I, I don't really want to be doing this. And, uh, so I did door to door because that was 
that was the only real like skill that I had is the only thing I knew how to do. And I was like, if I just go get a desk job, I'm going to be working for somebody else. I don't like or respect. I'm going to make like 40 grand a year. Like that's not really a good deal, you know, but my Bible degree that's unaccredited isn't really going to help me get a job doing anything else. Um, so door to door sales is kind of like the only thing on the table. So the first year that I did it out of college, that was like the first year I did it full time where it like that was the thing that I was focused on. And so my goal had been six figures for a couple of years. And um, when I, the first year I, I went full time, I hit six figures um, at, you know, 22 or 23. And that was- yeah, Let's not overlook it, man. That's huge, dude. I came from the sales world. I know that was always a goal and hitting six figures is big, uh, but both in personal income. And a lot of times it was- um, seven figures is like your sales goal, like the million dollars in sales typically yeah. got you to that six figure earner. So cheers to that, bro. 23 years old, really kind of, uh, you know, learned it on the streets kind of situation. I have a yeah, lot of respect literally, for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have a lot of respect for that. And you were also providing for your family too, right? It was you and your wife at the time. And now you have a beautiful family. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got married before I graduated college, which is why like, you know, I, I didn't have the, let me couch surf until I figure it out, uh, uh you know, yeah. era of my twenties. It was like, I got, I got married, I graduated from college and I bought a house all within about nine months. And That's so crazy. I didn't, I didn't really have another option. You know, like I yeah. it's like, I have a mortgage to pay. I have bills. You went from like your 23rd birthday to your 38th birthday like in yeah one well year. <laughs> it was really like 20 to 21st is really when all that happened right but um, i'm just saying I, like how far you projected oh, right, as far right, yeah, as right, having right. the house and the kids and all that you, you correct really, yeah yeah it happened yeah. in a short period of time and it kind of forced me to like figure it out you know mm -hmm. um so yeah i i did door to door and then counterintuitively at the end of the year after a successful year that's when i figured out i didn't want to do it anymore um because i was just like I felt like I was already bumping up against the ceiling of where I was, which was a scary place to be at 22. And I knew that I wanted a lot more and that that opportunity maybe didn't have the ability to give it to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I, you know, at that point it was just lost, man. I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm, I, I, I don't want to do the door to door thing, which is the only thing I'm good at. And I don't want to use my degree because it, I mean, first of all, it's pretty useless anyway. It's an unaccredited Bible degree. Like it doesn't, sure. it doesn't even really count as a bachelor's. Like if I tried to go take a master's program somewhere, they wouldn't let me in. I would have wow. to redo, I would have to redo probably 75% of my credits uh, mm -hmm. for my bachelor's degree and get a new, get another bachelor's degree so that I could qualify for a master's program, you know? So it, it was like, do I, like, do I go back to school? Do I go to the fire department? Do I apply for the FBI? Like I was looking at everything, man. I back against the wall. I had no idea what I was doing, but I always knew that I, I like business always intrigued me and I wanted to make good money. And so, um, uh, started jumping into personal development, reading some books, listening to audio books, came across podcasts for the first time. Yeah. And, um, I was going to jump to that and I, 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 I'm glad you brought it into the progression of your story. So that that's similar to myself where I didn't necessarily have a family member or, or, or someone to look up to. I had a couple people that were successful in the family of like, oh, let me see what they did. But it wasn't like, hey, Mike, let's sit down with you. And it sounds like you very much leaned into books and kind of the audio side of things and podcasts. So who were some of the people you were diving into at that point? Uh, yeah. So uh, for f a few of the first podcasts I started listening to were uh, Jordan Harbinger's show. Um, at the time, it was called The Art of Charm. Uh, now it's the Jordan Harbinger show. Um, and John Lee Dumas, Entrepreneurs on Fire, uh, Lewis Howes, Grant Cardone, Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, yes. Bigger Pockets, real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, those were really like the first few. Tim Ferriss, yeah. a couple times I listened to just because I heard he was good on the other shows I listened to. Absolutely. Uh, but I, st I really started consuming a lot of John's stuff because it was so much of it and because they were like short, bite sized episodes. And I just needed something like to drive to the gym to, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like the Mount Rushmore right there. You got, you mentioned John Maxwell. I heard uh, Grant yeah. Cardone, yeah. Uh, Lewis House is in there. Gary yeah. V. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Totally feel it's at the university on wheels, as we call it, right? As you're going yeah. back and forth to the gym or your appointments, you're just pouring into your think tank. Totally. Yep. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. So, um, I just, I've got to listening to so many podcasts and then John Lee Dumas had this call to action on one of his shows that was like, Hey, check out my free podcast course. If you want to start a podcast, you know, and I was like, that sounds interesting. Let me, you know, I have no idea how that would work. I have no idea how I'd make money on that, but like that seems like a really cool thing to do. 
with my time. So let's check it out. So I ended up taking that and decided to start a podcast. And then it wasn't until like a year after that until I actually launched the stupid thing. But, um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of the beginning of everything. Yeah. See, what I want people to think about right now is you may be in a place where you're successful, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is what you're going to be doing for the rest of your life. It's a hard thing to pill to swallow to go, Hey, I'm doing well. Cause I, you know, I've been in this predicament where it's like, I'm doing well, but I still don't feel the fulfillment. So reflect on it. I mean, you just saw Travis was in this moment, but he reflected on it. And then also what's, what's cool is things come to us. Our dream isn't always the same dream when we we're 10 years old, you know, like I want to be a shortstop for the New York Yankees type dream. Like, uh, you know, that wasn't my calling in life. It was at that time. I ended up getting into like film and I wanted to do that. We all have our own different paths. But in your story, you didn't know that podcasting was your next step or the thing that really grabbed your heart and said, Travis, we have a place for you here. And if anyone doesn't know your story, check out uh, Guestio again. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the things he's done in the podcasting space. It's been absolutely incredible. So let's transition right there. I mean, that really brings me kind of my next question is, you know, talk about some of the key benefits that you've personally experienced in actually launching your podcast, Grow Your Network. Yeah, dude. I mean, it's, uh, there, I, I talk how about many, time, how like many I, to list? We could be yeah, here for exactly. two hours. Like I, it, it literally, like I, without, at the risk of sounding, you know, exaggerative here, it right. literally changed my life, man. Like podcasting mm -hmm. completely changed my life because there's so many things that it does for you. There's so many benefits that come along with it. Even if you never get a single listener, um, like to me, the listeners at this point are like, that's the cherry on top. It's like, wow, yeah. you listen to my show, man. Thank you so much. That's <laughs> awesome. You know what I mean? Like right. I would still do it if you didn't, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Because of all the other benefits that come along from it. So like number one is knowledge, accumulation of knowledge. It's like the best accountability partner to learning new things. Cause if you're anything like me, I felt when I started my show, build your network, I didn't know much about networking. And so I felt that I owed it to my audience to continue to try to up level the way that I was doing it so that I could properly communicate those, you know, tools, tips, tricks, and everything else back to them. So I started reading the top books on networking, the, you know, consuming the top articles, blogs, getting my hands on whatever I could to learn how to network better so that I could more effectively communicate how to network to, uh, to, to my audience. And then, you know, I had at the beginning, I didn't do any solo shows because I didn't know anything about networking. I did three interviews a week, every week for um, a couple of years. And when you talk to that many people, not only does your network exploding the whole time, but you're able to ask them whatever questions you want to ask them. And so like, I'm getting like almost like private mentoring sessions, right? you know, to the tune of like 12 a month on average. Uh, with a bunch of people who I who I respected and trusted and, and thought were doing good things in the world. And so like to be able to get around that many people, talk to that many different, uh, uh, like see the world through that many different perspectives, it, it really like starts putting everything else in your life. Like you start talking to people when, when you're, when you're struggling to, you know, cause at that time when I transitioned from door to door to podcasting, that was the first time I'd ever transitioned in my career and took a pay cut. When I start, when I stopped selling alarm, when I stopped selling solar, started selling alarms, I took an increase. When I stopped selling alarms and started selling uh, water purification, it was an increase. Like everything I was done was, was always like, I don't care what I sell, I just pay me more money. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it could be X Y Z as long people. as it's a transition, that, like yep. a step up on the yep. ladder. Yep. Yeah. But th this 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 was a slingshot though, a couple steps back to launch exactly. way 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 and forward. That's, that's the tough part. That's the part that people don't aren't either aren't willing to do or they've put themselves in a position financially where they can't. They have right. way too many expenses and they've locked themselves in, which is why I or they're maybe thinking about the wrong thing. You just said it. Like you you weren't looking for a million listeners to your first episode. You just were happy to get up get together with great people that you can learn from. And you're just like, this is a privilege that I get to talk to uh, and I mentioned some of the big names at the top of the show, but I know you interviewed Ed Milet, one of my favorite people on the planet. And uh, you just you got to get to know him. He's become somebody you could probably reach out to now and say, Hey, what's going on? It's Travis, right? Like, it's funny. These opportunities it's funny. come. It's funny you say that, bro. Like he literally was just texting me this morning. There you go. See, yeah. like, and that came through you take getting uncomfortable, starting a show, something you didn't know how it was going to go. You didn't associate it to, I need to monetize this immediately, or it's just, it's a failure. You had the right idea of let's build this thing organically and see what comes from it. Now, I, the, the reason I pause to say that is, a lot of people reach out to me and they want to monetize their show right away. They don't, but they have like 
the, the work has to happen first. Like yeah, the it's effort, like, of the work. <laughs> yeah. Of course you want that. I want that. Everybody wants yeah. that, but it's not how it works. <laughs> like, right. It doesn't matter yeah. like how much you want it. Like it's not how it works. You know, like if, yeah. like the people, the, the problem is people see the fringe examples. They see like, because they're so visible, they see the Joe Rogans or like, they see the viral moments and they think like, that's what it means to be successful. Mm -hmm. And while that is possible, it is absolutely not probable. It is way, 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 way more likely that you'll start a show, be 100 episodes in, and still have 220 downloads an episode. And you're right. wondering why your show is not growing. That's much more likely mm -hmm. scenario for anybody listening. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it, though. You know what I mean? And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to figure it out how to make it happen for yourself. Because like, if the end result is worth is, is like, you just have to ask yourself if the end result is worth it is my point. Cause for me, it was like, when I looked at the end result of like, if I were able to accomplish this, what would that mean for me, my lifestyle, my family? It was like, uh, it, it would, it would, it would literally change everything that we're doing. It would be like a dream come true type of a thing. And if, if that's the case for you, then it's probably worth pursuing and figuring it out. And it's worth going through the pain, risking the, the finances, the financial and mental investment, the, the work, the hours, it's probably worth doing all of that. If you think that the end is worth, is worth doing it for, because frankly, not everything is worth doing all that stuff for. You find out pretty quick, you, you start getting more clarity when you're like, hey, if, if I achieved like everything that I set out to achieve in this area, like would I be, would I be super ecstatic with the results that came from that? And if the answer is like a hell yeah, then it's probably worth putting in the work. But like I've looked at several things, uh, you know, doing, uh, you know, you, you, you could do so many other things and so many other businesses and it's like, well, when I look at the end result of that, I don't want that end result bad enough to put in the work that's required to get to that level in that certain thing. But I will look at something else and think it with that thing. So it just depends, you know, it depends on if, if it matters to you, then I think it's worth pursuing. Yeah. And I'll say this too, uh, again, to the audience tuning in, that's either getting started, maybe you're a hundred episodes in like Travis has talked about and maybe feeling that frustration of lack of growth and that's by your terms, but think of it this way, like out of those hundred episodes, and if you didn't get started yet, I want you to foreshadow, you have a hundred episodes right out, right out, uh, in the moment. So put yourself in that situation and think, okay, I got a hundred episodes. Think of all the people, the moments, the connections that come from it. It's not just the 100 people you've interviewed. If you're doing that kind of a show, you may, someone may introduce you to someone that becomes a client that becomes you know, a, a close friend, a mentor. I've interviewed people who I've hired them to coach me and I get amazing coaching. And it's not the dollar I'm paying them per hour. It's the million dollar idea that they helped me develop that's going to come about. And right. you may not see the fruition for a year or two years. Like I know when I started my show, I had no idea I'd be interviewing you today and great guests and, and some people who have become clients of mine from the show. And I could show a handful of examples that it, the ROI on it is is ridiculous, right? Yep. So it comes, but again, it comes with the to the right people at the right times if you're doing the right things. I know that sounds kind of corny, but it's so true. Like the effort. Yeah. Well, like the it, it, like I, I don't know a single successful person that would say that luck doesn't play a role in success. Mm. You know, like I, I don't buy into that. I don't buy that like you can control 100 percent of everything all the time. That's not how it works. Like there's a lot of things that happen outside of our control. Luck and timing are two major factors in success. But you'll notice, that's why that, I forget who said it, but someone said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Because the more, t the more opportunities you give luck to help you out, the higher likelihood of, the higher likelihood that luck will actually step in and help you out one of those times. Yeah. You got to be prepared for it. Otherwise, the ball's thrown your way and you just drop it. You got to be ready to catch it and run it in. Yeah. To me, man, it's, it's, really, it's really about the at-bats. You know, it's like, it's like, what, what are the odds that you're going to step up to the plate the first time and hit a home run? Like, probably not good. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. You know, you could just get really lucky. But it's not probable. You know what I mean? And so every time you step up to bat, you get a new chance to hit a home run. But the thing that, the thing that most people leave out because of they, they get scared. You, you hear stats, you know, and, but stats don't reflect – uh, you know, hard work and knowledge and everything else. It's like, oh, well, your chances of having a successful business are like 3% or whatever. I, I think I heard that recently, like only, only like one, like 1.5% of businesses ever, ever make it to the eight figure mark or something like that. 
Um, and you know, 90% of small businesses fail within 10 years. And it's like, man, those are bad stats. And it's like, yeah, but that's not like the lottery type stats. It's not like, it's not like you pick a number and hope your business is successful. It's every time you step up to bat, you're a little bit better than you were the last time you learned, like you, you're getting better every single time. So like now when that pitch comes, you have a, li- a higher likelihood of hitting a home run, not just because of how many times you stepped at the bat, but because of all the skills you've come like that you've picked up along the way as you take that next swing. You know what I mean? And, and so that's, that's, that's why I, I see like, you know, I think luck and timing plays, plays a factor in success for sure. But the people who are the most successful typically tend to give themselves as many at bats as they can get so that they get better over time and they increase the likelihood that luck will meet them at some of those, you know, at some point along the way. You, know, you look at a Hall of Fame baseball player, though, they're batting, they're hitting it three out of 10 times. 300 right. batting average is actually a good batting average, and that's three out of 10. It's like in business, yeah, it may be that low percentage, but here's a thing like that's a little bit different. I love sports analogies and I use them all the time on the show. So uh, our audience is very familiar with that. But uh, the thing that's a little different about business, it's kind of similar to podcasts. It's like there's like 2.8 million podcasts that are kind of out there, call it in circulation. Doesn't necessarily mean they're making new content every week, but they're out there. Um, you know, and like less than 50%, somewhere around 50% don't make it to episode 50. Like it's such a small percentage that even continues on. Episode so really 10. To, episode 10, there's the cliff. But again, like ep- I want to say it's one in five. So like 20% get to that 50th episode. It really drops off a lot. So a lot of times when I'm helping clients, it's like that, let's get your consistency down. We'll continue to make the show better over time. Um, but the thing that changes, like we were talking about businesses too, is getting started and having such a small percentage. So many give up and, and either fold or, you know, something happens where they're not around anymore. But at the same time, if you keep going, there's going to be new ones that start. There's going to be old ones that go, you know what I mean? Like your consistency can keep you in the game. Try to stay in the game as long as possible. And what I love that you just said, Travis, is you either win or you learn We've said that hundreds of times on the show too, where, um, and then you can, the next time you see that at bat or you get your chance, you're going to understand that the ball is going to come a different way. You'll be better prepared for it. So I think that could tie to podcasting and certainly tie to business. Um, and this next question actually ties both of those together. So you're definitely set me up here, a little alley-oop action under, under the net. You just keep feeding me. Um, yeah, let's talk about some examples that you've either had, so real life situations you've dealt with through podcasting or kind of hypothetically how podcasting can certainly help out business and organizations, how they can be thinking about this for their communication and their marketing strategies. Before we had Guestio, we we set up, we helped, did, we did a lot of podcast coaching, consulting, production work and stuff like that. And it was always it was always interesting to see how the show would benefit them because everybody thinks when they start a podcast it's about the listeners, mm-hmm. and uh, then they start the podcast and they realize like oh, I really enjoy doing this. So there's like one benefit, you know, like oh this is just fun. Oh, I didn't realize that that person that 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 ideal client that I've wanted to get my foot in the door with over the last year and a half, but they wouldn't respond to my cold emails, is now all of a sudden saying yes to a podcast interview, and now I'm jumping on a call with them next week to ask them questions for 45 minutes. Like that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Networking, access, business development. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is just like the opportunities that come from it. We call it engineering serendipity, right? Like you can't. Uh, you can't engineer serendipity. That's why it's called serendipity. But if you could engineer serendipity, it would be through stuff like a podcast because of the opportunity creation that exists within within you know itself. So, and that's that's if you like have a show, if you're on other shows, like if you're leveraging this this channel as a marketing source, um, it, things are going to go well at some point. I like it's it's hard sometimes a hard sell because it's like, I don't know what it's going to be when it's going to happen. Or like we, I can't be like, Hey, I guarantee you, you will 10 X your revenue in three months or whatever. I can't do that. But I can say that if you do it for over a, a long period of time, you're not going to regret the time that you spent doing it. Um, if you, you know, actually put some effort into connecting with people and stuff like that. So like we had, uh, we set up this one real estate investor with a show and he, 
does syndications, multifamily real estate syndications. He's raised like seven million dollars from private investors through just having them as guests on his show. His show doesn't have massive reach, but he just connected with them as guests, and he's raised over seven million dollars through his podcast. Um, he was a client of ours. We have another another guy that was a lender. Um, who reached out to us a couple weeks ago that was like, hey, just want to give you guys an update. You know, He started his podcast with us like a year, year and a half ago. He'd been doing it for a while. He built a little studio in his office. He had realtors coming through all the time. And so this lender in his, in his area, the head of this association, basically was like, hey, we want you to come work with us and we want you to kind of be this like director level position and we want you to help all the, all, all, basically all of our you know roster of LOs that work with us to like, start with this content thing, this podcasting they're doing, because it seems to be working well for you. So when he started with us, he was making like 200 grand a year as a lender. Um, he, like, he was a good lender, you know, he was doing a good job. But this position he just got offered all in compensation is over $600,000. And he got it directly from having his podcast. And that's one of the things that he's helping people with in that position is doing the podcast. Be like, like, that's the kind of stuff that I can't tell people. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. when he was looking at doing coaching with us, I couldn't look into his future and be like, hey, one day you're going to get offered this massive promotion directly from this show, even if nobody ever right. listened to it. Like, I can't say that, but it happens. You know, like our real estate investor, you know, client, it was like, yeah, we set the show up in order to be able to work with people that you're that you're interviewing, but it's not a guarantee if it's going to work. You know what I mean? But mm-hmm. you end up raising over $7 million from it. You know what I mean? Like for right. every story like that, there's so many others that I could go through where just like, Random opportunities like that. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking at an event based on, you know, whenever this airs, it's uh, it's in a couple of weeks from now, but, you know, first week of June. And uh, there will be 1,500 people there. I'm one of the keynotes on the last day. And that opportunity came from me being on a show three years ago. Somebody listened to the episode. They ended up... Um, they ended up jumping into my coaching program and did uh, coaching with me. They started a podcast and that podcast was specific to this this niche, this uh, this one industry. And because at the time there was no other shows in that industry, which is why I said like, hey, get super specific on the name. He named the show like the name of the industry. Didn't get try to all get all get all cute with it or whatever. So the next year he got invited to be like an MC at the event because he was now being seen as like an authority in that particular industry in that space, even though he was pretty new to it. Um, and, uh, so he got the perceived authority checkbox. And then what happened was, uh, they started asking him about the podcasting stuff. So he introduced them to me and then they asked me to speak on their stage as a keynote. So like this show that I was a guest on and then, and then a client that I got from that appearance started their show, brought on this other guest, got booked as a speaker, introduced me, and now I'm speaking in front of 1500 people and they're letting me sell on stage. So like massive that's a beautiful you know, example right there man yeah i mean it's just like i don't know how to like i said i don't know how to pitch that to somebody but i can right. say that like i've experienced it you know a bunch of times you know having the podcast yeah. has brought me on stages in australia and puerto rico yeah. um a lot of people do outbound to get booked on stages i don't right. like every time I, i'm on a stage it's because people booked me not because mm-hmm. I reached out to them and pitched them on a lot happens a organically speaker. through it, man. And I get like, I do, I get two stuff just here and stuff like that. I've experienced a lot of it myself through mic'd up. And I've seen a lot of our clients as well that we've worked with that are podcasters have similar stories. So again, do you, there, that there's no guarantee when you start a podcast that you're going to have that kind of opportunity, but it, there's a 0% chance if you don't get started and um, doing the right things. Like here's the thing. And the reason I had you on the show, you didn't just start a podcast. You didn't just have this background in it. Like you've done it and you've taken it to a high level and you've utilized it. I don't like to say used it because that sounds like you're kind of used and abused. You've utilized it as a median, as a way to get into and with these people you want to hang out with, right? These are guys and gals you want to hang out with. If you get to choose, you're going to get a cup of coffee with them anyway, right? But you're able to do that on your podcast. Pick their brain. They pick your brain. It feels good. You're vibing at the right levels. And so podcasting, again, to me and, and to our audience, think about it as, in a way, as an opportunity, a way to hang out with the people you want to hang out with. And eventually yes. you get invited to the party. In this case, the party, quote unquote, is this event. You're speaking in front of, you said, 1,500 people, right? Yep. It's a huge opportunity. That's awesome. And uh, it's not because you got lucky. We talked about luck a minute ago. The ball was thrown in the air or the pitch was pitched to you and you were able to hit a home run because you were prepared for it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, jury's out on if it's a home run, right? But it's, it's at least a single right now. So we'll see. Well, yeah, you got to do your part, but still you, you're, you're getting that opportunity because yeah, of the work correct. you put in. Absolutely. Hey, we're going to do uh, take a quick time out here with Travis. We'll be right back guys. Two quick minutes to give some love to our sponsors. Podcasting is a great way to engage with your audience and stay consistently relevant. The only problem is you don't have the time or desire to produce your own show. You simply want it done for you. And that's where Social Chameleon comes in. All you need to do is press record and upload the files. We'll handle the rest. From planning, production, post-production, distribution, and digital marketing, we have you covered. We realize that times are tough and funds are tight. And Social Chameleon believes in building supportive business relationships. By clicking on the link in this promo, we'll provide you seven free podcasting tips to get started, as well as a free 30-minute online consultation. This is the perfect opportunity for entrepreneurs, keynote speakers, industry experts, influencers, and anybody who has a personal brand. With Social Chameleon, we help you build a brand that is out of this world. We're ready and waiting. So what are you waiting for? Click on the link to get started today. Hey guys, it's Mike. I'd like to give a proper shout out to Navigator Bookkeeping. Look, for a long time, I ran my business without really understanding the full financial picture. I used my gut and my bank account balance to make decisions, which led to some poor choices and constant stress over my business's finances. I knew something needed to change. At the beginning of 2021, I made a decision that helped pave a more clear path for my business. I started working with Navigator Bookkeeping. Since then, my bookkeeping has been handled for me. I now understand the full financial story of my business, making important financial decisions much easier now, and it helps me plan for where my business is going. I highly recommend giving Navigator Bookkeeping an opportunity to help your business. Check them out at navigatingyourbooks.com. Again, that's navigatingyourbooks.com. It's time to know the full financial story of your business. All right, we're back in action with Travis Chapel. You guys can connect with him on social media. Those links are clickable in the show notes. Keep it super easy to connect with him. Um, we want to dive a little bit into your some of your backstory and some of your influence as well. So you talked about some of those kind of the Mount Rushmore podcasters that you were tuning into in the early days. Share what you're you know putting into your think tank today, and not only the podcast side of it, but who are some of your business influences that you say like, all right. You know, either I've tapped into some of what they're teaching or I've actually hired some of these coaches. I want the people listening right now that are looking to level up to have some thought process around um, really leveling up their game. He actually wrote an article um, a few weeks ago called 11, 11 Men I'm Looking Up To in 2022. Um, and people that I take advice from and try to implement a lot of things. Like now it's, it's uh, I get a lot more... Sp- I guess I kind of always have done this, but um, trying to be more specific when I'm trying to learn a certain thing or get around a certain, you know, aspect if I'm missing something in my business. So like right now, it's like, yeah, I've done door to door sales and stuff, but I never built a, I never built a um, uh, remote phone sales team. And so like, that's something that we're trying to build into our agency right now. And so like one of the people that we hired recently is Cole Gordon, who runs a company called closers.io and uh, they they are helping us install a couple of uh, setters and closers into our business um, and with systems and processes, SOPs and everything. And so, you know, he's somebody I look to for advice around those things. Um, the other things like I'm in a, uh, the 100 million mastermind with Dan Fleischman and Joel Mary and Joel just sold his company for multiple nine figures, supplement company. He's got a 20 million person email list, master email marketer, copywriter. And then Dan is just like one of the smartest business guys that I know. He has several businesses, all of them doing, you know, eight figures, if not multiple eight figures. Uh, he exited his he 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 was he took his first company public. He was the youngest founder of a publicly traded company in history at like twenty one or something like that, twenty years old. Um, he took a comp- his first company public um, and has had multiple businesses since then. Really, really well connected guy. Um, yeah, so I, I I look I look to a lot of people like that. Um, and then I still I still grab from a lot of the OGs too, man. Like I still like I, I went to a mastermind in Cabo with uh, Grant Cardone and like twenty five other people a couple weekends ago. 
so I'm still look, looking at them, still learning from Gary Vee and a few people like that, man. So um, I I try to I, I try to you know bring in a multitude of of, uh, of perspectives uh, so that I can have a more holistic approach to uh, what I'm doing. Uh, but if it's something like a super specific, then that's when I try to go find somebody who does that one thing and does it really well, and so they they can help me get it done. Which is why we're working with Cole's team right now on the sales stuff, right. So important, like you have certain traits and talents that come natural to you, some that you've been working on. Again, just like the sports analogy, some talents are going to come gifted and natural to someone and some they're going to need to work extra, extra hard to really polish. And um, you've done both of those. You've had some of your natural gifts and you've also went out of your comfort zone. But you've also identified that, hey, there's people that can A, do things I don't want to do, which is fine in business. We don't all want to do be in the accounting or the, you know, figuring out the uh, the taxes and all that stuff. That's at least for me, I'll speak for myself, that I do not enjoy doing. But there are people that are gifted that that's what they're really good at, crunching the numbers. And so you're like, hey, I'm going to hire this guy to do sales. I'm going to hire this gal to do this, hire this guy to do that. And uh, so you can stay in your lane and really continue to be firing on all cylinders, right? And um, it's allowed you to, to really build a really nice name for yourself in the podcast industry. And also what I want you to do, we usually don't do the infomercial thing on here, but I'm going to give you the floor. Tell us about Guestio. Tell us about someone's podcasting already, like myself, or someone who wants to get started. Why should they go to Guestio? Yeah. So if you're a podcaster, we built Guestio really for podcasters originally. Um, it, it's kind of shifted into more like helping guests get booked on podcasts rather than helping podcasters book guests. But um, Mm -hmm. both of them happen and they can still happen in the marketplace. So the goal for us was like, we noticed that our show started growing more organically when we had a lot more credibility and authority in our show based on the guest lineup that we had. So you can go to Guestio, create a free account, browse through our marketplace, and you can book guests onto your show. Some of them are free. The highest quality ones obviously are all paid. Um, so they have like a speaking fee, like a podcast speaking fee that are attached to their profiles. You can go directly there pay them, book them, pay them to market the episode to their audience and do all of that inside of, inside of the, uh, uh, the Guestio marketplace. Right. So it may start off where the connection is something you may, you paid, you know, whatever it might be 25, some of them could be up to a thousand or several thousand dollars, but there's so many of people there. I notice in the, on the platform, cause I scoped it out to prepare. Uh, you do have a lot of great names in the, in the industry. Um, but the thing is like we talked about earlier, you may, interview someone, but that's not the end of the relationship. Like now it's up to you to somehow continue that relationship and give, 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 and provide value to the person you interview. Or if you're on a show, provide value to the person who's interviewing you. And that may become a connection. You're certainly not paying for it just to try to take away something from it. Like, oh, if I get in front of Travis, I'm going to, you know, take him for everything he's worth. So it's a great platform to build your network. But you're, what I love about it is you're saying, we're getting quality, not quantity. This is Correct. quality. Yeah. Yeah. That's our big thing is we, we didn't want to go for just like a bunch of people. We just want, we want good quality connections that are happening there. And if uh, you're serious, you're going to go. Have, yeah. Yeah. Which is why it. we have the pay to play on there. You know, it's like, you can't get quality people without paying them. You know, mm -hmm. like I, like you can, don't get me wrong. I did it, but it, you know, might take you 11 months. So like, would you rather spend 11 months of cold reach out, rejection, backdoor channels, events, going this place, that place, sending uh, DMs or whatever, or like pay a thousand bucks and get them on next week? You know what I mean? Sure. So yeah, um, it's either, it's going to take time or it's going to take money. So whichever one you got more of, use that. I, I would rather use money because money's replenishable and time is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great and, and you can work it into whatever system you have. Like for me, I've been blessed with having amazing guests come through my organic network, if you want to call it that. And, um, you know, I haven't really had to go that route. But at the same time, I know like, okay, this is someone I identified. I want to get them on the show. Let's cut to the chase and make it happen now, right? Instead of doing that Kevin Bacon thing, like who's the seven people I need to get involved with before I can get to Travis or however that worked out. As a show as well, you can also get paid for your appearances. So we tell people like if it's an inbound pitch, you can charge. If it's outbound pitch, you're probably going to pay. Um, now, all of it could happen for free. You could just go pay 97 bucks a month and pitch people for free every month and you can get some free stuff happening and that's all good. Um, but uh, 
but yeah, the, you know, the best results you're going to see is if you come with a little bit of budget, if you have like, just set a budget, you know, I have a hundred bucks a month to spend. I have a thousand bucks a month to spend. I have 5,000 bucks a month to spend, whatever, whatever your budget is, set your budget and go book some good guests, you know? Right. Yeah. And you get them, it's like, you're, you're taking the hunt away. Like it's just, everyone's hanging out. It's like going to a VIP party basically is what it is. When you walk in the front door, Tra- Travis and his team has it all laid out there for you. Um, speaking of, you know, you're running guestio, you're guesting on shows, you're hosting multiple shows. Um, you mentioned, you know, that you're a, a husband. Um, I want you to give some light to your family for a moment. I know you have a dog, you got the family going. How do you manage it all? So we're not just talking about managing time here. I'm talking quality time with your kids so you can be the best dad, be the best husband, you know, take the dog out for a walk. How are you doing all that? Like, what? I know there's no magic trick behind it, but I'd love to hear a little bit about how you personally have navigated that. Yeah, first off, I think it was accepting that balance is a myth. Um, it's it's just, it's almost one, it's, you know, actually something I learned from my, I think my first interview with Ed Milet in like 2017 or 2018, when I first had him on the show, was one of those things where I was like, it, it, my workload was starting to increase. And I was like, how do you start balancing these types of things? You know, and most of the successful people that I know are just like, they're, look, there's no such thing as balance. You know, everything's like, something's going to be out of balance. You're giving attention to the business. The family's going to suffer a little bit. You're giving attention to the family. The business is going to suffer a little bit. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, prioritizing your activities and setting boundaries on your time for certain things. So like, that's, that's what it is for me. You know, I take, I take my son to school in the morning and then every night, um, I shut down, you know, around, I don't know, five thirty to six thirty somewhere in there. And then, um, they go to bed around seven thirty to eight. So I'm with the family for, you know, two hours every night. Um, but I'm also like, in order to do that, I also know I got to get the gym in cause I, that's not something I'm willing to compromise on. And I know that I got to get all my work in before I take the night off. And so most days I'm up around four thirty or so AM because I know that I have to go to the gym while the kids are still sleeping. I got to come back, watch the kids while my wife goes to the gym and then she comes back. And then I have, you know, then, then we can kind of both get into our work days at that point after I take my Sunday school. So we, you know, start working seven, eight o'clock, um, and, uh, work in, uh, till a lot of times I'll skip lunch to be honest, just not even, not yeah, because I want to, rolling. just because yeah. I forget, you know, um, yeah. But if I do, if I have a protein bars to, have been an amazing thing to get through that little lunch hour. <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, there's this place locally called foodie fits, like a meal prep place. Um, so we have Perfect. just like meal prep boxes in the fridge. And so if I yeah. have time in, in between calls on a mm-hmm. round lunchtime, I'll go microwave up some meal prep and get a water and go back to work, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but like you're like like you're strategic about it. That's the thing I want to point out is like, you have this four thirty starts at 4 30 gym kids in the morning get to work by eight o'clock you know where you're gonna be you know it's not you're not waking up and saying let's hope for the best yeah and then you know i I block my calendar off on right now i don't because uh we're building out that sales team and so i'm doing a lot of extra stuff to try to get them running but um Mm -hmm. typically my monday and friday schedules are blocked off there's nobody can schedule any calls on mondays or fridays um, they're just mm-hmm. like project days and then they're like kind of recovery days cause I travel a ton on the weekend. So it's like, I want to be able, if I get back late on a, you know, Sunday night or even I'll get back on a Monday afternoon. It's like, mm-hmm. I just keep my, my Monday morning, especially Monday morning and Friday afternoon blocks completely clear, um, for project work and thinking and strategy and some of the other things that I think move the needle for us the most. Um, I take the majority of my calls Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all, almost all of my podcast interviews, whether I do them on other people's shows or for my show, almost all of them are on Wednesdays. Um, we'll do some on Tuesday or Thursday occasionally. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I, I try to like, I give my assistant pretty like strict guidelines on what she can and can't schedule on like certain times of, you know, the day. But then what ends up happening is like, you know, today I started calls at six thirty this morning, my time, and, uh, I won't be done until five o'clock this evening. Um, yeah. just calls on calls on calls on calls. So, uh, it's just, but I know that that means that on Friday that I'll have a pretty wide open day. Now this Friday I'm traveling again, but to another event, but, um, 
you know, if, if I were home, it, it would be pretty open because I knocked out my calls on Tuesday. Um, so I, I just try to be very intentional. I try not to let calls on my calendar as often anymore. Um, uh, like they're only there if they're like a sales call Purpose. or an opportunity call or it's an interview. Like right. I, I, you just like, you get to a point where it's like, I cannot waste any more time. I mm-hmm. physically like don't have the time to waste. So I have right. to get more strategic about it. And my kids honestly kind of helped with that. They were like, a, a, I mean, they're, they are, I, I say were, they are a handful and they're super stressful. Obviously the most, you know, beautiful thing that's ever happened to me and, and all the boilerplate things about having kids, you know, enter here. But, um, uh, it was really overwhelming at first, man. Like my, my son's three, my daughter's a year and a half. So we're, we're kind of like coming up on the other side of it now. Um, and it'll get easier, I think every on a, you know, monthly basis from here on out. But the first year of her life was really, really, really tough, you know? And so it got to the point where it was like, I, I literally, I physically don't have enough time during the day. If I want to stay healthy, I want to stay in the gym and I want to get all my work done and I want to spend time with my kids, then I cannot spend my work hours doing things that are not within the realm of things that I should be doing. So it forced me to start like giving more responsibility to my team, hiring more team members, getting them trained up. It like literally forced me to do it because it would have been impossible to, to get everything done in like any other way, you know? So, so good guys. Go back and listen to that again, because uh, Travis lays it out there for you. If you're having a hard time, kind of, we joke about the word balance, but making sure that you're in the, you're the one who's dictating your game plan, right? Like you don't want to show up and be a part of, kind of an employee of your own, the own madness of your calendar. Like then you're just basically being dragged through it. So, um, I struggle with that a lot. Like I do have a regimented calendar, but I find myself making some compromises late in the week. Like, Oh, I got to get this in. And all of a sudden something gets pushed and I'm doing it on a Saturday night because it didn't get in at Friday at five. So one thing that's super helpful for, for me that I, um, have my, like even my leaders within my team do um, I just bought them all journals for this. Uh, there's a great journal from Michael Hyatt called the full focus planner. Um, and, uh, it, 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 at the beginning of the day, basically, or if I can, I'm, I'm, I've gotten bad at this in the last month or two. I really need to get back on it cause it's super helpful to do it. If the night before you can look at your next day, write all your appointments down and then, and then look at your quarterly and yearly goals and then reverse engineer the things that need to get done this week and then the things that need to get done this day in order to be able to accomplish your weekly, quarterly, annual goals. And if you take those and you write out um, Andy Frisella calls it the power list um, and then Gary Keller and Jay Papazan always refer to the one thing. Their whole, their whole thing is like, if I can do one thing today that moves the needle, what is that one thing? You know what? The one thing, the one thing such that by doing that one thing, it makes all other things irrelevant. Yeah, there you go. It's right there <laughs> on your desk. So I don't have to tell you. So they talk about one thing. Andy yeah. Frisella has the power list, three things. I like to write them out in order. So like the first thing I write out is like my one thing. Like if I can accomplish this one thing, it's not a loss of a day. But I really, I have those three priorities. It's like one thing, two thing, three thing. If I can get these three things done, like done today and accomplish all my calls, answer my emails, clear my Slack notifications, like it is, it is a win for the day. Um, I'll have a bunch of other like secondary to do's. Like if I have some time to get to them, I'll get to them. Uh, but like those three primary things, it's like, okay, let me knock these off the list first. Um, and then like at the end of the day, I I can look back and go, okay, I know that I got some things accomplished. Cause like, if you're just doing busy work, sometimes you can be working all day and you get to the end of the day and you're like, did I even do anything today? Like you're exhausted and tired and like you, you got a bunch of stuff done, but it wasn't any of the stuff that like moves the needle on your main project. So it doesn't feel like you got anything done. Right. So like significant. Yeah. 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 Like I'll, I'll say I, I could relate bro, because like, you know, early on as an entrepreneur starting the company, I was always busy, 12 hour days, all that stuff like you just mentioned. But I noticed in my calendar, I would have like 20 things, you know, like a half hour each, just one after another, after another, after another. And I was meeting with as many people as I could because that was really my strategy to grow my network. Um, but now it, it, it's very much more focused on the, the three to five things in that intentional. day. Intentional wins, like something that's going to be not always ROI focused, but certainly we talked about those quarterly goals. Like if this isn't leading me somewhere forward on that big picture, is it really necessary anymore? And if if the answer is no. It's it's, what, what is the thing that you provide the organization that nobody else does? How does that skill set fit within my goals? 
And what practical things today can I do to move those goals along within my superpower? Yeah. Like those are the conversations you have to have. But I think that's yeah. at the beginning. That's why everybody kind of does that hamster wheel thing at first because like you don't really know the answers to any of those questions first. Yeah. <laughs> you you know got to like, go business. and experience like, it and then just yeah. try to stop making the same mistake multiple times. I think Ed says it, Ed Milet says it best. It's like, you know, if you, if you did it once, like kind of shame on you, but like making a, the same mistake a second time, now it's actually more of a choice. Like you're choosing to do it because you know better. If you yeah, keep buddy making, of mine, Mark, um, owns yeah. a company called Iconic. They do like, um, canvases, like, uh, motivational quote canvases and they license and trademark a bunch of things, did deals with Gary Vee and Tom Bellew and Marvel and different things like that, or maybe not Marvel, but some other big company. Anyway, multi eight figure e-com company. But, uh, one thing that he said on my show that, that we liked and kind of like turned into a quote was, um, always and only make new mistakes. Yeah. It's like make new mistakes, make mistakes often, but only make new mistakes. Like it's like, that. it's really good to make mistakes. You should be failing. You should be making mistakes. But after you made the mistake, don't make it again. You mm -hmm. know, I thought that's that was how really you show good. you're growing. Like if you're not, if you're making the same mistakes or playing small, you won't have these opportunities to learn from it. So I think that's awesome. I know we have like a handful of minutes. I have really two more questions. One, I'm going to give it, feed it to you and you could do it whatever you want with it. So is there something that we haven't talked about yet? Any topic, anything that you're like, man, I just want to bring this to your audience. Is there something we didn't hit on? I mean, I'm such the networking guy that I just always hammer that in the most as I can because relationships have changed my life. The podcast, the podcast was like, I, just, I don't want to sound, you know, repetitive like because I said the podcast changed my life, but like ultimately the podcast brought me relationships and mm -hmm. relationships changed my life. That's, that's really what the answer is. Um, so to mm -hmm. me, like you want to get where you're going fast go find somebody who's been there, done that and is willing to help like give you the roadmap. Um, and that's like, like, it's really as simple as that. There's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of ups and downs that happen within that. And it's not going to be as easy as I made it sound just now, but it is that simple. Yeah, it is that simple. I agree. I've, I'm living proof of it too, guys. I mean, you've seen, if you've watched the show here and this isn't your first time tuning in, you'll see that that's happened. I mean, I've, many people I met through Mike Depp have become friends, clients, networking, t speaking uh, gigs like Travis has coming up, coming from the show. So many different, I mean, we, I just did a presentation on 20, 25 different benefits that come from it. So um, I love it. Last question for you. And then you can share any, anything you'd like at the end here is, Think of it this way. We talked about the multiple books that we tune into and the podcasts that we listen to, but think of it this way. So you're the author and protagonist in your own life story, right? So if you get to write the ending and God willing, you continue to live a long, prosperous life, you're looking back on it, you're reflecting on it, you get to define your legacy. What would that be? Uh, to me, man, it's um, creating something that lasts beyond my time on earth. So... Um, whether or not my kids get involved or decide they want to do the same thing I do, that's inconsequential to me. It's like, I want them to do what they want to do. And if they want to get involved, they can get involved. But either way, like, uh, um, since we've been talking about him, Ed talks about it all the time where like, he talks about the one person in the family tree that comes along and changes everything for the family forever. That's my goal for me is to be the person in my family that, that came along and like changed the chapel family tree moving forward for everybody. Um, so that's, I mean, it's, you know, obviously those are, those are, uh, big goals, big dreams, but, um, but yeah, that, that's, that's good. That's, yeah. that's what, that what's what keeps me motivated, man. The, you know, the kids, the kids were a, a renewal to my why, which was always that creating something bigger than myself and, um, having an impact that exists beyond just the people that know me on an intimate, you know, family type basis. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well said. This whole interview flew by. I mean, 55 minutes just came and went. Um, and it's because, you know, I feel like we had a lot in common. And uh, I talked probably a little bit more than I usually would because of how common our stories are. I got a lot to relate with you on. And I love when I ask the question about legacy. That is, all the questions kind of come and go on the show. I like to prepare and make them customized for the person I'm talking to. But I really like to end on that legacy question. And I get chills when I when I'm hearing the answers, because a lot of the times the person answering it like yourself just now is already doing the things. It's not like you have this like lofty, Oh yeah, this legacy thing is going to be real cute. And I'm like, you're doing it, brother. You are already changing. You, your kids are already looking up to you, whether you know it or not. They're sponges. I appreciate that. Man. Thank you. 
And yeah, and and you know, your wife has a lot to be proud of from what I can see. The things you're building in your life, bro, these are legacy type game changing, um, long lasting uh thing. I, you know, it's not just a podcast, it's business, it's the personal brand that you've built for yourself that you're gonna continue to drive. That is game changing. And it's it will set uh whatever your kids wanna do. I like how you said that too, because I'm always thinking about my seven year old daughter and what she wants to do. And who knows what that's going to look like. But uh, you're definitely putting two feet in solid foundation for your family right now to build that legacy. So cheers to you. Cheers to your continued success. I always leave everybody with this. Be great and be grateful. Thank you so much for being on the show. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for having me. This is fun. I'd like to give a huge shout out to everyone for tuning in, especially those who listen all the way to the end to hear this message. Seriously, I appreciate you and my guests do as well. Giving a quick reminder to subscribe to this show. It's completely free and will allow you to receive notifications when new episodes are released. If you'd like to provide a tip as a gift, you can do so via patreon.com backslash mic'd up. It's spelled M-I-K-E-D up. Patreon.com backslash mic'd up. You can give as little as $1 per month or as much as you'd like. Every dollar is greatly appreciated and completely unexpected. Appreciate your reviews and your messages coming in on social as well. Keep them coming. Your feedback is valuable and absolutely means the world to me. You can check out more episodes and content at mikeduppodcast.com. We're powered by Social Chameleon. You can also follow me on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active, and it's at Mike DiCiocio, M-I-K-E-D-I-C-I-O-C-C-I-O. Thank you so much for your continued support. You guys know what to do. Be great and be grateful.